Dodging in from the rain-swept street, I exchanged a smile and a glance with Miss Blanche in the bar of the Three Crows. This exchange was effected with extreme propriety. It is a shock to think that, if still alive, Miss Blanche must be something over sixty now. How time passes! Noticing my gaze directed inquiringly at the partition of glass and varnished wood, Miss Blanche was good enough to say encouragingly, Only Mr. Jeremy and Mr. Stoner in the parlor with an other gentleman I've never seen before. I moved towards the parlor door, a voice discoursing on the other side, it was but a matchboard partition, rose so loudly that the concluding words became quite plain in all their atrocity. That fellow Wilmot fairly dashed her brains out, and a good job, too. This inhuman sentiment, since there was nothing profane or improper in it, failed to do as much as to check the slight yawn Miss Blanche was achieving behind her hand, and she remained, gazing fixedly at the window panes which streamed with rain. As I opened the parlor door, the same voice went on in the same cruel strain. I was glad when I heard she got the knock from somebody at last. Sorry enough for poor Wilmot, though. That man and I used to be chums at one time. Of course, that was the end of him. A clear case, if there ever was one. No way out of it. None at all. The voice belonged to the gentleman Miss Blanche had never seen before. He straddled his long legs on the hearth rug. Jeremy, leaning forward, held his pocket handkerchief spread out before the grate. He looked back dismally over his shoulder, and as I slipped behind one of the little wooden tables, I nodded to him. On the other side of the fire, imposingly calm and large, sat Mr. Stoner, jammed tight into a capacious Windsor armchair. There was nothing small about him but his short white side whiskers. Yards and yards of extra superfine blue cloth, made up into an overcoat, reposed on a chair by his side. And he must just have brought some liner from sea, because another chair was smothered under his black waterproof, ample as a pall, and made of three fold oiled silk, double stitched throughout. A man's handbag of the usual side looked like a child's toy on the floor near his feet. I did not nod to him. He was too big to be nodded to in that parlor. He was a senior Trinity pilot, and condescended to take his turn in the cutter only during the summer months. He had been many times in charge of royal yachts in and out of Port Victoria. Besides, it's no use nodding to a monument, and he was like one. He didn't speak, he didn't budge. He just sat there holding his handsome old head up, immovable, and almost bigger than life. It was extremely fine. Mr. Stoner's presence reduced poor old Jeremy to a mere shabby wisp of a man, and made the talkative stranger in tweeds on the hearth rug look absurdly boyish. The latter must have been a few years over thirty, and was certainly not the sort of individual that gets abashed at the sound of his own voice, because, gathering me in, as it were, by a friendly glance, he kept it going without a check. I was glad of it, he repeated emphatically. You may be surprised at it, but then you haven't gone through the experience I've had of her. I can tell you it was something to remember. Of course, I got off scot-free myself, as you can see. She did her best to break up my pluck for me, though. She jolly near drove as fine a fellow as ever lived into a madhouse. What do you say to that, eh? Not an eyelid twitched in Mr. Stoner's enormous face. Monumental. The speaker looked straight into my eyes. It used to make me sick to think of her going about the world murdering people. Jeremy approached the handkerchief a little nearer to the grate and groaned. It was simply a habit he had. I've seen her once, he declared with mournful indifference. She had a house. The stranger in tweeds turned to stare down at him, surprised. She had three houses, he corrected authoritatively. But Jeremy was not to be contradicted. She had a house, I say. 
he repeated with dismal obstinacy. A great big ugly white thing. You could see it from miles away, sticking up. So you could, assented the other readily. It was old Colchester's notion, though he was always threatening to give her up. He couldn't stand her racket any more. He declared it was too much of a good thing for him. He would wash his hands of her, if he never got hold of another, and so on. I dare say he would have chucked her, only it may surprise you, his missus wouldn't hear of it. Funny, eh? But with women, you never know how they will take a thing. And Mrs. Colchester, with her mustaches and big eyebrows, set up for being as strong-minded as they make them. She used to walk about in a brown silk dress with a great gold cable flopping about her bosom. You should have heard her snapping out rubbish or stuff and nonsense. I dare say she knew when she was well off. They had no children and had never set up a home anywhere. When in England she just made shift to hang out anywhere in some cheap hotel or boarding house. I dare say she liked to get back to the comfort she was used to. She knew very well she couldn't gain by any change, and moreover, Colchester, though a first-rate man, was not what you may call in his first youth, and perhaps she may have thought that he wouldn't be able to get hold of another, as he used to say, so easily. Anyhow, for one reason or another, it was rubbish and stuff and nonsense for the good lady. I overheard once Mr. Apps himself say to her confidentially, I assure you, Mrs. Colchester, I am beginning to feel quite unhappy about the name she's getting for herself. Oh, says she, with her deep little hoarse laugh, if one took notice of all the silly talk, and she showed Apps all her ugly false teeth at once, it would take more than that to make me lose my confidence, sir, I assure you, says she. At this point, without any change of facial expression, Mr. Stoner emitted a short, sardonic laugh. It was very impressive, but I didn't see the fun. I looked from one to another. The stranger on the hearth rug had an ugly smile, and Mr. Apps shook both Mrs. Colchester's hands. He was so pleased to hear a good word said for their favorite. All these Appses, young and old, you know, were perfectly infatuated with that abominable, dangerous... I beg your pardon, I interrupted, for he seemed to be addressing himself exclusively to me. But who on earth are you talking about? I am talking about the Apps family, he answered courteously. I am nearly let out a damn at this. But just then, the respected Miss Blanche put her head in and said that the cab was at the door if Mr. Stoner wanted to catch the 11-3 up. At once the senior pilot arose in his mighty bulk and began to struggle into his coat, with awe-inspiring upheavals. The stranger and I hurried impulsively to his assistance, and directly we laid our hands on him he became perfectly quiescent. We had to raise our arms very high and to make efforts. It was like caparisoning a docile elephant. With a thanks, gentlemen, he dived under and squeezed himself through the door in a great hurry. We smiled at each other in a friendly way. I wonder how he manages to hoist himself up a ship's side ladder, said the man in tweeds, and poor Jeremy, who was a mere North Sea pilot, without official status or recognition of any sort, pilot only by courtesy, groaned, he makes eight hundred a year. Are you a sailor? I asked the stranger, who had gone back to his position on the rug. I used to be till a couple of years ago, when I got married, answered this communicative individual. I even went to sea first in that very ship we were speaking of when you came in. What ship? I asked, puzzled. I never heard you mention a ship. I've just told you her name, my dear sir, he replied. The Apps family. Surely you've heard of the great firm of Apps and Sons, ship owners. They had a pretty big fleet. There was the Lucy Apps, and the Harold Apps, and Anne, John, Malcolm, Clara, and Juliet, and so on. No end of Appses. 
Every brother, sister, aunt, cousin, wife, and grandmother, too, for all I know, of the firm had a ship named after them. Good, solid, old-fashioned craft they were, too, built to carry and to last. None of your newfangled labor-saving appliances in them, but plenty of men and plenty of good salt beef and hard tack put aboard, and you go off to fight your way out and home again. The miserable Jeremy made a sound of approval, which sounded like a groan of pain. Those were the ships for him, he pointed out in doleful tones that you couldn't say to labor-saving appliances. Jump lively now, my hearties. No labor-saving appliance would go aloft on a dirty night with the sands under your lee. No, assented the stranger with a wink at me. The Apses didn't believe in them either, apparently. They treated their people well, as people don't get treated nowadays, and they were awfully proud of their ships. Nothing ever happened to them. This last one, the Apse family, was to be like the others. Only she was to be still stronger, still safer, still more roomy and comfortable. I believe they meant her to last forever. They had her built composite, iron, teakwood, and green heart, and her scantling was something fabulous. If ever an order was given for a ship in a spirit of pride, this one was. Everything of the best. The Commodore captain of the employ was to command her, and they planned the accommodation for her like a house on shore, under a big, tall poop that went nearly to the mainmast. No wonder Mrs. Colchester wouldn't let the old man give her up. Why, it was the best home she ever had in all her married days. She had a nerve, that woman. The fuss that was made while that ship was building. Let's have this a little stronger, and that a little heavier, and hadn't that other thing better be changed for something a little thicker. The builders entered into the spirit of the game, and there she was, growing into the clumsiest, heaviest ship of her size right before all their eyes, without anybody becoming aware of it somehow. She was to be 2,000 tons register, or a little over, and no less on any account. But see what happens? When they came to measure her, she turned out 1,999 tons and a fraction. General consternation. And they say old Mr. Apps was so annoyed when they told him that he took to his bed and died. The old gentleman had retired from the firm 20 years before and was 96 years old if a day, so his death wasn't perhaps so surprising. Still, Mr. Lucian Apps was convinced that his father would have lived to a hundred, so we may put him at the head of the list. Next comes the poor devil of a shipwright that Root caught and squashed as she went off the ways. They called it to the launch of a ship. But I've heard people say that from the wailing and yelling and scrambling out of the way, it was more like letting a devil loose upon the river. She snapped all her checks with little pack thread and went for the tugs in attendance like a fury. Before anybody could see what she was up to, she sent one of them to the bottom and laid up another for three months' repair. One of her cables parted, and then suddenly, you couldn't tell why, she let herself be brought up with the other as quiet as a lamb. That's how she was. You could never be sure what she would be up to next. There are ships difficult to handle, but generally you can depend on them behaving rationally. With that little ship, whatever you did with her, you never knew how it would end. She was a wicked beast, or perhaps she was only just insane. He uttered this supposition in so earnest a tone that I could not refrain from smiling. He left off biting his lower lip to apostrophize me. Eh, why not? Why couldn't there be something in her build, in her lines, corresponding to what's madness? Only something just a tiny bit wrong in the make of your brain. Why shouldn't there be a mad ship? I mean mad in a ship-like way, so that under no circumstances could you be sure she would do what any other sensible ship would naturally do for you. There are ships that steer wildly, 
and ships that can't be quite trusted always to stay. Others want careful watching when running in a gale. And again, there may be a ship that will make heavy weather of it in every little blow. But then you expect her to be always so. You take it as a part of her character, as a ship, just as you take account of a man's peculiarities of temper when you deal with him. But with her, you couldn't. She was unaccountable. If she wasn't mad, then she was the most evil-minded, underhand, savage brute that ever went afloat. I've seen her run in a heavy gale beautifully for two days, and on the third, broached to twice in the same afternoon. The first time, she flung the helmsman clean over the wheel, but as she didn't quite manage to kill him, she had another try about three hours afterwards. She swamped herself, fore and aft, burst all the canvas we had set, scared all hands into a panic, and even frightened Mrs. Colchester down there in these beautiful stern cabins that she was so proud of. When we mustered, the crew was one man missing, swept overboard, of course, without being either seen or heard. Poor devil! And I only wonder more of us didn't go. Always something like that. Always. I heard an old mate tell Captain Colchester once it had come to this with him, that he was afraid to open his mouth to give any sort of order. She was as much of a terror in harbor as at sea. You could never be certain what would hold her. On the slightest provocation, she would start snapping ropes, cables, wire hawsers, like carrots. She was heavy, clumsy, unhandy, but that does not quite explain that power of mischief she had. You know, somehow when I think of her, I can't help remembering what we hear of incurable lunatics breaking loose now and then. He looked at me inquisitively, but of course I couldn't admit that a ship could be mad. In the ports where she was known, he went on, they dreaded the sight of her. She thought nothing of knocking away twenty feet or so of solid stone facing off a quay, or wiping off the end of a wooden wharf. She must have lost miles of chain and hundreds of tons of anchors in her time. When she fell aboard some poor unoffending ship, it was the very double of a job to haul her off again, and she never got hurt herself, just a few scratches or so, perhaps. They wanted to have her strong. And she was strong enough to ram polar ice with, and as she began, so she went on. From the day she was launched, she never let a year pass without murdering somebody. I think the owners got very worried about it. But they were a stiff-necked generation, all these apses. They wouldn't admit there could be anything wrong with the apse family. They wouldn't even change her name. Stuff and nonsense, as Mrs. Colchester used to say. They ought, at least, to have shut her up for life in some dry dock or other, away up the river, and never let her smell salt water again. I assure you, my dear sir, that she invariably did kill someone every voyage she made. It was perfectly well known. She got a name for it, far and wide. I express my surprise that a ship with such a deadly reputation could ever get a crew. Then you don't know what sailors are, my dear sir. Let me just show you by an instance. One day in dock at home, while loafing on the forecastle head, I noticed two respectable salts come along. One, a middle-aged, competent, steady man, evidently, the other, a smart, youngish chap. They read the name on the bows and stopped to look at her says the older man, Apps family. That's the sanguinary female dog, I'm putting it in that way, of a ship that kills a man every voyage. I wouldn't sign in her, not for Joe, I wouldn't. And the other says, if she were mine, I'd have her towed on the mud and set on fire, blame if I wouldn't. Then the first man chimes in, much do they care, men are cheap, God knows. The younger one spat in the water alongside. They won't have me, not for double wages. They hung about for some time, and then walked up the dock. Half an hour later, I saw both of them on our deck, looking about for the mate, and apparently very anxious to be taken on. And they were. What would you say? He retorted. Recklessness. 
the vanity of boasting in the evening to all their chums. We've just shipped in that there apps family. Blow her. She ain't going to scare us. Sheer sailor-like perversity. A sort of curiosity. Well, a little of all that, no doubt. I put the question to them in the course of the voyage. The answer of the elderly chap was, A man can die but once. The younger assured me in a mocking tone that he wanted to see how she would do it this time. But I tell you what, there was a sort of fascination about the brute. Jeremy, who seemed to have seen every ship in the world, broke in sulkily. I saw her once out of this very window, towing up the river, a great black ugly thing, going along like a big hearse. Something sinister about her looks, wasn't there? said the man in tweeds, looking down at old Jeremy with a friendly eye. I always had a sort of horror of her. She gave me a beastly shock when I was no more than fourteen. The very first day, nay, hour, I joined her. Father came up to see me off, and was going down to Gravesend with us. I was his second boy to go to sea. My big brother was already an officer then. We got on board about eleven in the morning, and found the ship ready to drop out of the basin, stern first. She had not moved three times her own length, when a little pluck the tug gave her to enter the dock gates, she made one of her rampaging starts, and put such a weight on the check rope, a new six-inch hawser, that Ford there had no chance to ease it round in time, and it parted. I saw the broken end fly up high in the air, and the next moment that brute brought her quarter against the pierhead with a jar that staggered everybody about her decks. She didn't hurt herself, not she, but one of the boys, the mate, had sent aloft on the mizzen to do something, came down on the poop deck, thump, right in front of me. He was not much older than myself. We had been grinning at each other only a few minutes before. He must have been handling himself carelessly, not expecting to get such a jerk. I heard a startled cry, oh, and a high treble as he felt himself going, and looked up in time to see him go limp all over as he fell. Uff, poor father, was remarkably white about the gills when we shook hands in Gravesend. Are you all right, he says, looking hard at me. Yes, father, quite sure, yes, father. Well then, goodbye, my boy. He told me afterwards that for half a word he would have carried me off home with him there and then. I am the baby of the family, you know, added the man in tweeds, stroking his mustache with an ingenious smile. I acknowledged this interesting communication by a sympathetic murmur. He waved his hand carelessly. This might have utterly spoiled a chap's nerve for going aloft, you know, utterly. He fell within two feet of me, cracking his head on a mooring bit, never moved, stone dead. Nice-looking little fellow he was. I had just been thinking we would be great chums. However, that wasn't yet the worst that brute of a ship could do. I served in her three years of my time, and then I got transferred to the Lucy Apps for a year. The sailmaker we had in the Apps family turned up there too, and I remember him saying to me one evening, after we had been a week at sea, isn't she a meek little ship? No wonder we thought the Lucy Apps a dear, meek little ship after getting clear of that big, rampaging, savage brute. It was like heaven. Her officers seemed to me the restfulest lot of men on earth. To me, who had known no ship but the Apps family, the Lucy was like a sort of magic craft that did what you wanted her to do of her own accord. One evening we got caught aback pretty sharply from right ahead. In about ten minutes we had her full again, sheets aft, tacks down, decks cleared, and the officer of the watch leaning against the weather rail peacefully. It seemed simply marvelous to me. The other would have struck for half an hour in irons, rolling her decks full of water, knocking the men about, 
spars cracking, braces snapping, yards taking charge, and a confounded scare going on aft because of her beastly rudder, which she had a way of flapping about to raise your hair on end. I couldn't get over my wonder for days. Well, I finished my last year of apprenticeship in that jolly little ship. She wasn't so little either, but after that other heavy devil, she seemed but a plaything to handle. I finished my time and passed, and then just as I was thinking of having three weeks of real good time on shore, I got at breakfast a letter asking me the earliest day I could be ready to join the Apps family as third mate. I gave my plate a shove that shot it into the middle of the table. Dad looked up over his paper. Mother raised her hands in astonishment, and I went out bareheaded into our bit of garden, where I walked round and round for an hour. When I came in again, Mother was out of the dining room, and Dad had shifted berth into his big armchair. The letter was lying on the mantelpiece. It's very creditable to you to get the offer, and very kind of them to make it, he said. And I see also that Charles has been appointed chief mate of that ship for one voyage. There was, over leaf, a P.S. to that effect in Mr. Apps's own handwriting, which I had overlooked. Charlie was my big brother. I don't like very much to have two of my boys together in one ship, Father goes on, in his deliberate, solemn way, and I may tell you that I would not mind writing Mr. Apps a letter to that effect. 